everybody. Um, gosh, it is really bright, isn't it? Um, I'm Lizzie. I'm the producer of a film called The Age of Stupid, which you may have seen. It's a climate change documentary set in the future, kind of looking at what will happen if we don't solve climate change. Um, so we crowdfunded. This is kind of more of a practical case study. I think lots of the things that Matt talked about, I kind of, we kind of did them, but we didn't really know the terms for them or anything like that. Um, we crowdfunded the film. We came up with the idea in 2004. Two girls, flat in Camden, no money, thinking, how are we going to make this film? And the reason we crowdfunded it was to keep editorial control, keep control of the distribution, and because we thought that the people who made it and the people who believed in it at the beginning should profit from it financially rather than big um, you know, financiers and people like that. Basically, we're total control freaks, even though we like to have people participating only in a controlled way. <laughs> no, that's not true. Um, so we did this crowdfunding model. It started with 100 people at 500 pounds each. We had no idea if it would work, and um, it was kind of quite secretive in the beginning because we were filming with Shell Oil Company, and we had to be a bit under wraps for the first two years. Um, so we'd have these kind of small events. People would come along, and it just took off, really. It started working right from the beginning. So after we raised the first 50,000, then we, and we spent it. Um, we went out, and we went for 5,000 pound shares, and then 10,000 pounds. So... People who put in £10,000 at the end got the same percentage of the profits that the people who put in 500 at the beginning. There's 337 investors, and they all own a share of the profits. We pay them back once a year for 10 years, um, if there are any profits. Um, so why did we not, you know, why did we go for the cinema? Because lots of people used to say to us, um, you know, you're making a film about climate change, you're trying to change the world, why don't you just give it away for free and put it on the internet? Um, well, after four years of making it, part of, partly we wanted to see it in the cinema, but really it was all about impact, because for us, making the film was about changing the world, and so we wanted it to have the biggest impact possible, and we wanted people to go to the cinema. We believe that it's a more um, emotional experience when people see it together. As we've gone along, we've realised that it doesn't need to be in a cinema, um, but we wanted it to have hype, um, and so we wanted it to get press coverage, and so we went for kind of big um, premieres as our way of doing that. So you'll see a few um, photos behind of our UK premiere, which was kind of making an, an event out of a film premiere. So um, we wanted to do a big premiere, but we didn't want to um, blow loads of carbon. So we decided to do the Guinness World Record biggest ever and greenest ever film premiere. So it was in, um, actually I'll play your clip, which will um, explain exactly what it was. The Age of Stupid has battled for years to make it to its green carpet premiere tonight, hailed to be the first ever powered by solar energy. We're having a solar cinema 10, and then it's simultaneously broadcast live to 65 sites around the country. In fact, Guinness Book of Records have just confirmed that it's going to be the largest simultaneous premiere in history, celebrities arriving by a solar car and that kind of thing. Ten years ago, I was flying all around the world doing film after film. No idea about my carbon footprint. Now I think very seriously. This film is so powerful. It makes you take a very serious look at your life and what you are contributing to the global problem. Politicians are frightened to tell people you shouldn't travel so much by air. But if we don't make these changes, then there isn't going to be a world for our grandchildren. Let me start by saying that it was an incredibly moving and brilliant film and to congratulate you. you and I want as many people as possible to see this. I can announce to you and the world that the Maldives will be the first carbon neutral country in the world. So yeah, for us it's all about kind of make it getting impact, so turning our premieres into events was perfect. Um, the UK premiere only had 1% of the carbon emissions of a typical Hollywood style premiere, um, but achieved a huge amount of press coverage, we were on all the TV news and in the papers and things. Um, partly because of the no novelty value, but what we had is 10,000 people around the country going to their local cinema, so they weren't all coming to one central venue. We had no one flying whatsoever. One flight would have been more than the carbon emissions of the whole premiere. And so we realised with that, um, and we realised with that, that the power of people and of communities kind of doing the promotional work for you. Um, we had our investors, our crowdfunders, and they'd been amazing going out to all their networks and promoting the film because they felt personally, you know, they had, did have a financial investment, but really they were proud of it and they wanted it to do well. And so then with the UK premiere, with these 62 sites, we kind of gave them to people, allowed them to be the host for the premiere. And they got certain benefits. Um, they were able to have a st stand outside, that kind of thing. So it was a real partnership with um, the NGO community um, to get as many people to see the film as possible. 
Now, as I'm always promoting stuff, Age of Stupid, I'm going to pass around um, an email list. So if you want to hear about our work going forwards, please email on there, and that'd be great. Thank you, guys. So from the UK premiere, we decided um, that we wanted to do this on a bigger, on a more global scale. Um, so we decided the central event should be in New York, a solar-powered cinema tent in New York, and that we would have high-profile speakers. We had Kofi Annan, we had Moby, Radiohead's Tom York. So once again, turning it into a real event, we had 421 cinemas simultaneously playing Age of Stupid across America, which, if you're trying to get Americans to buy tickets to a climate change documentary that they've never heard of. Yeah, that, that's fun, with no advertising budget. Um, we, I think Houston, I think I heard there were, yeah, six people in the cinema in some of, some of the places there, but it sold out in the bigger cities. But for us, it was all about building this um, kind of community of people who wanted to do something. And we've gone on with the people from our mailing list to form the 1010 climate change campaign. Um, and just to show you the kind of lengths that we would go to to try and get the film out there and to do things that are a bit different, um, to get this American 421 cinema distribution, we had to convince a really commercial American uh, distributor to work with us. And um, they were all about the money. They thought they were going to make a lot of money from this. So they weren't too impressed afterwards. But um, we, really, we needed them on board um, because they're the only ones that do 421 cinemas. So I'll show you the trailer that they made, you know, which is kind of shows you where they're coming from and, and how different it is than us. Human activity is attributing changes in our Earth's climate. Will people in the future call our time the age of stupid? Why didn't we save ourselves when we had the chance? Or will humanity find a solution to the world's most urgent problem? You decide. Join Gillian Anderson, Kofi Annan, Radiohead's Tom York, and climate experts for a live one-night event, September 21st, in select movie theaters nationwide. Go to fathomevents.com for theater and ticket information. Uh, yes, not quite our style, but um, when they say climate experts, they were hoping for Al Gore. Um, you know, we got Ed Miliband. We, we, we thought that was pretty good, pretty good for us. Um, but by having these, there's, there's no way that people would have gone to see Age of Stupid if there weren't these kind of extra ad additional elements, like Tom York playing live for the global premiere, um, we wouldn't have had people going to see it in America. And in fact, when he posted about it on his Facebook page, so many people went to our website that our website crashed. So it was a bit um, counterproductive. Um, but you know, that's what we were always trying to do, is, is build interest with these additional elements. So once we had the New York thing lined up, um, and we had the the kind of key elements for this global premiere, we had the 421 cinemas across America, we decided that we wanted to have as many countries as possible have the, the Age of Stupid premiere at the same time. So we wanted to smash our UK, well, our Guinness World Record um, by having this huge kind of global film event. And it's all about driving interest to the film. Um, and so we worked with Arts Alliance, who are a fantastic kind of global theatrical distributor, and they put it into... I think they put it in cinemas in about 20 countries. But then there were lots of other countries who they were never going to get it in the cinema, but they wanted to do something, or people in those countries wanted to do something. So we just struck up a deal, and we said, you can have the premiere of Age of Stupid in your country. All you have to do is do something interesting. Tell us you know, what you're going to do. And um, you have to send in some photos, and you have to send in like a one-page report about it so that we can talk about it afterwards. And we never... You know, we just could not believe it when we started seeing the tweets and the photos coming in from around the world. The, am the amazing things that people had achieved. Like, if we had dreamed it up and tried to manipulate it all, being con uh, control freaks, we never could have done anything um, anywhere near as good. You know, I'll show you some of the, um, just some of the images that started to come in from around the world, and you'll get a sense of it. That's actually a cinema in Paris, I hear which was um, sold out. And so by giving people the ownership over the film and, and letting them do what they want with it, and in some cases keep all the money from the film premiere, we just created this incredible event. In Zimbabwe, for every person that attended, a tree was planted. In Amsterdam, um, they, the tram in Amsterdam made a special stop for that day at the cinema, and you could only come to the premiere if you bought an old piece of electronic equipment that was then recycled I mean, so every country kind of had its own take on it, and this all built up into a huge amount of excitement right around the premiere. I think that was in, um, 
Serbia. Yeah, when we saw it empty, we were a bit worried. But then we saw that lots of people went. So I guess from that experience and from crowdfunding the film, we kind of, we were learning all the time about people power and that um, if you give people the right tools and resources, they will absolutely astound you. I mean, one thing with our crowdfunding, I guess we didn't realise it, is that we were kind of crowdsourcing, not for the film, because Franny had very set ideas about what was in the film and what wasn't, um, but in terms of a lot of practical help, like if we needed, for example, when we were going to interview the vice president of Shell, we needed normal business clothes, which we didn't own any, so we put it out on the list of our crowd funders, does anyone have any business clothes we can borrow? And so someone wrote in and said, right, come to my house, and here's the outfit, you know, you can put in some kind of really weird shoes and things. Um, and, and then when we needed somewhere to record the orchestra, we put a message out saying, you know, we've got no money, we need somewhere quiet in central London. Someone wrote in, right, I've got a music studio, you can come in right away. And we didn't realise we were doing it, but by building those people into the process, you know, they were so engaged, and now a lot of those people have gone on to become our kind of major funders for this other climate campaign that we're doing. They've kind of stuck with us, I guess you would say. Um, and in terms of like moral support, because I don't know how many of you are independent filmmakers, but we were doing it on our own, you know, we didn't have a commission, we didn't have any distribution lined up, and if we didn't keep doing it, nobody was going to do anything, nothing would happen, and some days no one would really care. Um, and, but to have this network of our crowd funders, you know, everything was going wrong, we are in Nigeria, camera's been stolen, Franny's lost her glasses, whatever, and so you put a message on the list, and all of a sudden everyone's writing back saying, come on, you girls, you can do it, and um, maybe that's what it's like having the BBC behind you. I don't know. <laughs> like really nice kind of supportive messages. Um, so moving on from that, um, so these are some of the stars of our film. So we ensured that for our premiere, the documentary stars of the film, they kind of attended their own country screenings to add to the kind of press interest. Um, and with our crowdfunding, we gave a percentage of the profits from the film to the stars of the film because we didn't tell them beforehand, we told them afterwards. But they've put so much time and effort into making it, and they're so crucial to the success that we thought it was only fair that they get, you know, a significant, well, well a, good, a portion of the profits from the film. And so moving on, we, um, we decided to start this new kind of film distribution platform called Indie Screenings, which is, um, it's a, just a kind of simple software system, really, that allows people to book community screenings. When we were making Age of Stupid and, and around the premieres, we had so many people writing in wanting to hold a screening, and we were thinking, okay, are we going to negotiate each one individually? You know, how much does a, a, a small campaign group wants to have it in their front room versus a large corporate wants to show the film to their, like, ye yearly conference? You know, you can't charge them the same amount. Um, and as independent filmmakers, you're always looking for ways to bring in revenue. So we came up with this system, and basically it works out according to what you tell it, what the price should be. So if you're a big corporate and you're, and you're screening it to all your work, it's, it's about £5,000, I think. And if you're a small, the smallest um, NGO in the UK or screening it in your front room, it's like £35. And then you can keep all the anything else. So you just pay us the license fee. It's all done online. Um, and the people organising the screenings can keep the rest of the money. Um, so we launched that in the UK and it just took off. We've had 2,000 community screenings now organised through this system. And the great thing is it's totally automated. So you don't really have to be involved at all. Um, but then you just hear about the, the effect of the screenings. And we went global, so then we had to change the pricing structure slightly so that if you're a school in India, you're, it's like three pounds, um, just to, to kind of make it fair. Um, and so this system has been really successful, and I think there are other systems out there now that are kind of similar, where you basically put in your circumstances. Um, bit of a plug, we're running a training course soon called SWATS, um, which is a two-day kind of course, everything you need to know to make documentaries with no commission, crew, or contacts. Um, it's in London in, a, in about a month. We haven't quite decided the date. It's end of October, beginning of November. If you're interested, sign up. Um, and I wonder if anyone's got any questions, because I think I might have even finished early. That's so unlike me. Brilliant. <laughs>